Well, it's been so good to be with you this week. It's been, it's been so good to worship with you. The, the talent that is in, on this campus and in this church just blows my mind. It is uh, it's just amazing that you get to sit under this kind of leadership every single week, and it, is, uh, it has blessed me. I, I, I just want to say it has been so good to be home and it is, it's been so good to have my own spirit revived alongside yours as we've walked through um, some difficult texts and looked at uh, the, life of some pretty, the lives of some pretty complex characters. So tonight in our last night of revival, hopefully this will be the wrap-up. Uh, at the end of our evening together, we're going to meet at the Lord's table, but I invite you to be uh, attentive as, as we listen to the word of the Lord I invite you to turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 11, starting with verse 26. This morning, we learned about the indiscretions of David. We talked about the abuses of power, and we talked about uh, David and uh, Bathsheba, the fact that David was a complex person. And, uh, and so we want to we finish the week, but we also want to finish uh, the week with this story and to see how uh, it ends in David's life, at least at this point. So I want to invite you to stand as we honor the reading of God's word from 2 Samuel chapter 11, starting with verse 26. So hear the word of the Lord for us on this last evening of our revival. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The Lord sent Nathan to David. Remember Pastor Nathan? The Lord sent Pastor Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had, that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are that man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave, your, I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this has been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says, out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who, the one who is close to you, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say together, Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So we've been talking about this all week. David's story, it, it just really, it looks like the American dream. It's a rags to riches type story, but the story takes this tragic turn. David has gone from the underdog to the overlord. And slowly but surely, each move David makes removes God from the action and it places David in the center of the action. And when David removes God from the action, when he moves him, removes him from the st uh, center and he steps into the center himself, something, something transcendent happens, something theological. David becomes God, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present. This is the most sinister of temptations. 
take a bite, and then you'll know the difference between good and evil. You'll be able to make all your own decisions. You'll know what's right for you. You can do this on your own. No one can tell you what to do. You know for yourself better than anyone else knows. The most sinister of temptations is this. You will be like God. And the man that was after God's own heart has now ascended beyond his God, and he has captured the seed of the Almighty. He's got a new nickname. His nickname is the Divine David, the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent one. He commands his armies from afar. He has pulled Uriah's wife into the orbit of his will. He has determined the fate of Uriah the Hittite, and he even has has the power to pardon sins. When the report came to Uriah, came that Uriah was dead, there in chapter 11, he pardoned General Joab, his chief commander, and, and upon hearing uh, the report of Uriah's death, he said, oh, I see, that's too bad. Tell Joab, don't, don't trouble yourself over this. War kills, sometimes one, sometimes another. You never know who's next. You can read about that in 2 Samuel eleven twenty five. 25. Uh, Pharaoh Ramses II, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, Cyrus the Persian, Alexander the Great One, Lord and God Caesar Augustus, Herod the Great, Emperor Nero, Hitler the Chancellor, Divine David was a member now of this exclusive fraternity. And we, can, and we can all see with divine David at the controls, all, all hell is breaking loose. When Uriah's wife hears about her husband's murder, the grief of the woman disgraced is, is the culmination of all of Israel's grief, and it gives voice to ours, and it's unbearable. Divine David mocks the law of the God he once worshipped. It's a sham to everyone. And he, and he does so by waiting until her period of mourning was over. And then he claims her again like he's the sheriff of Nottingham, trying to, uh, what he tries to do to Marion of Loxley. He's forced the woman that he's abused to marry him. And his ultimate authority is on display, finally and forever here, and it comes with disgusting demand. The movie, if we were seeing it, it would give you chills. It's rated R. We would, we would suffer with the characters because we could see, we can see this in our own lives. David has silenced God. But David has forgotten that this God is only silent when this God chooses to be silent. And when God is silent, that does not mean that God is not present. Because what breaks the silence is a word. It's a word from God. And a word from God will get you. As we're reading this text, we need to remember that as Buchner says, the gospel actually starts out as bad news before it becomes good news. And pastor, uh, uh, David's pastor, Pastor Nathan, is sent to deliver a word. He says this, once upon a time there were two men living in the same town. One was a rich man, one was a poor farmer. Not much, is, not much description is given about the rich man except to say that he had everything he needed and everything he wanted. It doesn't take much imagination to immediately think of somebody we know that fits into this category. But the description of the poor farmer is deep and it's multi-layered and it's textured so it evokes compassion within us. The writer says that he is one young little lamb that he raised like his daughter. He loved her and she loved him, says Nathan. Well, one day this traveler comes to town and immediately the rich man went in to impress because he was stingy. So he jerks the crying lamb from the arms of the farmer and he leads the lamb to the slaughter. And he did it simply because he could. There's no other reason. And when David hears this, he was incensed. His anger could not be contained. Words, uh, words in the form of story like this move people. It can make them angry, and we call this form of storytelling a parable. Now, when Holly and I were, um, when we first moved to Oklahoma City, we were 
youth pastors at a church much like this one, and we found this house when we moved to Oklahoma City, and it, and it had a swimming pool, and we bought the house because we thought it would be a great idea to have students from our youth group over from time to time to come swimming, and we want to have parties and other things like that. So early in the summer of our first year of serving, our family went out of town for a few days, and when we got back, I noticed that there were some things in our backyard that just... Didn't, didn't feel right. Well, that afternoon I saw the neighbor. We were talking over the fence, and with a little bit of annoyance and a lot of condemnation, he said, looks like the kids in your youth group were having a good time last night. Well, you know, you know what happened. Apparently they jumped the fence that night to come swim in my house. They knew I was out of town. And apparently they were pretty loud into the night, and apparently they woke him up, and apparently he determined that I was the worst youth pastor in the world because when he looked over the fence, he saw several kids had shimmied up the side of my house and were jumping off my roof into the swimming pool. That, that was in 2005, and it makes me mad even today. Oh, I was so mad. Well, the next morning, I, I had to teach Sunday school. It was Sunday the next morning, and the whole group was there, and they were sleepy from a long weekend. And so I read a, you know, I read a proverb about the importance of, of seeking wisdom, and then I, I told them a story. And I started out this way. You know, we've all done foolish things. Boy, I've really, really done some dumb things. When I was in college... When I was in college, I realized that a lot of stories start that way, but when I was in college, I would, you know, my buddies and I would play this game called Fireball. Now, this is warning number one, okay? Do not play Fireball. Do not do this at home or at work or at school or anywhere. Do not do this. Do not play with matches of any sort. And while you're at it, please do not run with scissors. Do not cross the street without looking both ways. Do not lick an icy flagpole. Do not throw paper airplanes because you might put somebody's eye out. Do not, please, while you're in college, please, please, do not, do not, do not, do not do stupid things. Because when I think back on that, oh man, that was so stupid. That was so stupid. Well, after my freshman year here at Olivet, um, a couple of my buddies came to my house. They, I was living in Minnesota. They came to my house one night, and guess what we did? No, I'm even stupider than you think. It wasn't just that I played fireball. My brother, Matt, is eight years younger than I am, and when I left for school, he was only about 10 years old. So in the middle of the night, we decided to wake up my little brother, who was in elementary school, to teach him how to play this game. <laughs> and there we were, in the middle of the night, playing this game in the front yard with my 11-year-old brother, when my dad, Mark Pollock, bursts out the front door. Now, this is warning number two. Many of you don't know my dad, but... You know, if you do stupid things, he will find you out and he will come after you. You, you know, you don't know this, but uh, it's, not, it's not good to wake up Pops in the middle of the night for any reason. He has this regular 4.23 a.m. wake-up call, and it's not because he goes to work. He goes to work out. He goes to the swimming pool and he'll swim a couple of miles before he's worked out. He'll ride his bike 20 miles or so. He might go for a kayak, uh, a kayak ride or a run. And he's not exactly Mr. Happy when he wakes up in the middle of the night at 1.45 a.m. But when he wakes up because he thinks that the street is on fire, <laughs> and then he finds out that you've taught your elementary age brother how to play with matches... He's even less happy. I've never seen anything like my dad bursting through that front door with just his robe on before. I don't know if I have ever seen my dad that mad before. He couldn't, he couldn't speak. He, he was silent. And just because he's silent does not mean that he's not present. 
And if I didn't get how real the situation was, all I had to do was look over at my mother because she stood there on the front porch and she was crying. And in that moment, I realized what I, realized what I had done. I was a model to my brother. He looked up to me. I, I put my stamp of approval on this kind of behavior. I put his life in grave danger. I taught him it was okay to do a dangerous and reckless thing. He could do this when I wasn't there. He could kill himself or hurt himself. He could teach his friends this game, and maybe they would kill themselves or hurt themselves. And I looked at my youth group with all the sincerity and all the grace I could muster up, and I said, doing that was so stupid. It may have been the most stupid thing I've ever done, Everyone has done stupid things. And going over to my house in the middle of the night when I'm not home and jumping off my roof into my pool is one of the stupidest things that some of you have ever done. There was this collective gasp in the room and I heard somebody yell, Oh, he knows! Oh, man, I had them good. So I, you know what I did? I, I just screwed in the screws a little tighter, and I said, you guys have broken my heart. <laughs> I did it. I did it, Dr. Bell. I did it. You guys have broken my heart. I said, I love you. I love being your youth pastor. I've offered my life to you, and I've, I've given my best to you. One false move, you need to know this, one false move, one slip up, one accident, you're just not ended up on ridiculousness. Our ministry, everything that we've worked for, even our lives, it might be over. You took advantage of my best by giving me your worst. I'm sure this is how my parents felt the night that I was so stupid. And I'm sure that this is how silent God felt watching these events unfold in David's story. You know, with a word, it just took a word. Those students were tricked. Now, they thought the lesson was don't do stupid things, when in fact the lesson was deeper and the crime had already been committed. They just didn't realize it until the parable was told. And like my students at first, David, David didn't get the lesson. I mean, he's indignant by Nathan's story. His imagination is so captured that he wants immediate justice and he's just the man. He is divine David. He's the one who's going to carry out the sentence. Who's the man, he says. Get him here. He deserves to die. Oh, man, the power of a parable. Like a vortex of words, it just sucks us right in. I think that's why Jesus used them so often. He knew that, the par that a parable was like a, a ninja sneaking up on us or a leopard stalking us while we don't know it or like a python that's got us hypnotized right before it squeezes life from us. And Nathan, there's Pastor Nathan, and he squeezes the life out of David in one sentence, and it goes like this. My friend, you are that man. You know what we do? We speak about the gospel, the good news, and such like, it's like general futuristic terms, as if it's like somewhere out there. And we're always categori categorizing somebody else. But friends in this room, you are that man. You are that woman. You're that boy. You're that girl. The gospel is about you. I am that man. It's about me. The gospel is never a generalized truth. It's a truth specific. And it de demands a first person response. Because each life is tragic. Each one of us has had a time, a time, one time or another, that we've pushed God out of the center and we've tried to claim the title divine. It's, it's the oldest of traps. Well, B Frederick Buechner says that when the word comes after silence, what happens is we see the phony or the chicken or the slob peering back at us as we look in the mirror. That's the tragedy. But the gospel is bad news before it's good news. And that's good news. They say that David was a man after God's own heart. But the truth of the matter is this. God was a God after David's heart. That's the comedy that we call grace. 
It is the comedy that comes after the tragedy. He and we, David and we, he is and we are loved and cherished and forgiven and and, and bleeding to be sure. But we're also bled for. Before condemnation gives way, we're actually swept up into the, the restoring, forgiving, saving act of God. Maybe this is why St. Augustine, maybe this is, what he, this is why he used the phrase Felix Culpa. He said, oh, happy sin. Because only when I'm able to realize and confess my sin am I in a position to recognize the God who is able to save me from my sin. If I can't see and acknowledge my sin, then I miss, I miss the great and the central good news of this whole story, which is Jesus saves. I miss it altogether. Now, if there's something ridiculous, and there is also something that's absolutely hilarious about this, the gospel is bad news before it is good news, but in the end, it is always good news. Maybe that is why every single student that was at my house that night came to me, and they confessed. Some came in tears. Several came with their heads down. All were shamed. And you know what? Now we laugh hilariously because it was an opportunity for grace and it was an opportunity for forgiveness. And with some of those students, I've been privileged to marry them and hold their babies. And I've been able to pray with them as they worked out their own call to ministry or their college choices or talk through a job opportunity or a decision. I've gotten to sit with some during some very, very difficult days. And with one of them, I even went off and I planted a church. And the good news is that David, maybe for the first time, maybe for the first time ever in his whole life, began to realize the scandal that is grace. And he confessed his sins. In fact, he wrote a little bit about it. Psalm 51 is a song that he began to sing. And and it becomes our words when we confess our sins. God, don't throw me out with the trash or fail to breathe holiness in me. Bring me back from gray exile Put a fresh wind in my sails. Commute my death sentence. God, my salvation God. And I'll sing anthems to your life-giving ways. You know, at the H3 Church, we've made this commitment to tell the truth. As difficult as that might be. And here this week, we have made a commitment to tell the truth, both on campus and here in this sacred space that we call a sanctuary. And the truth is this. But there is always a way towards forgiveness. Out of our tragic lives, the word breaks in. And James, who was the brother of Jesus, said this, if we claim that we're free from sin, we're only fooling ourselves. A claim like that is, is just nonsense. But on the other hand, if we tell the truth and we admit our sins, he won't let us down. He'll be true to himself. He'll forgive our sins and he'll purge us from all the things that we've done wrong. David's sin, enormous as it was, was wildly outdone by God's grace. So I think the way in which we respond to this good word is we finally start telling the truth about our tragic lives and and the actions that have contributed to this tragedy. And then we ask God, who was powerful enough to forgive David, to forgive us as well. Uh, in just a minute, we're going to be coming to the Lord's table. And, uh, and as our communion servers are getting ready, this is the way in which we want to close our revival services. But uh, as they're getting ready, I want you to listen to a song uh, that my friend Scott Phillips wrote a few years ago. And I would love for this to be a song of confession for us. And I would love for you to make this your prayer. The lyrics will be on the screen. Our communion servers are coming to distribute the elements. And uh, I want you to hold on to the elements so that we can receive these, these elements together. But listen to this song and make it your prayer.